If you have your Bibles, you'll want to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 30, verse 24. We're going to be reading a couple of verses there. Before we do, let's pray together. Almighty God, we seek your face. We would hear your voice. I ask that you would speak to us today, that your Holy Spirit would be strong, would be unhindered, that we would walk in your ways, that we would think your thoughts, that you would increase our faith and obedience, that we'd see this world through your eyes and act as you would act. It's through Christ we pray. Amen. Proverbs 30, verse 24 says, Four things are small on the earth, but they are excessively, exceedingly wise. The ants are not a strong people, but they prepare their food in the summer. The rock hyraxes are not a mighty people, yet they make their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet all of them go out in ranks. The lizard you may grasp with your hands, yet it is in the king's palaces. We've been reminded recently of the impact of small things in our lives. Today, as I record this, it's been a horrible day in uh, American history. Um, Decisions made uh, behind desks uh, influence lives and directions of nation and um, impact a nation for decades to come. We've learned to appreciate this because of the effect that COVID has had on us. The COVID-19 virus, I understand, is about 0.3 microns or less. Now, a micron is one one one-thousandth of a millimeter. That's about one one one-hundredth the diameter of an average human hair. That's in about twice the size of the brain of an average cat. In other words, it's very tiny indeed, but it causes terror. It's changed the world. I remember when I was growing up, we were afraid of nuclear attacks. We were afraid that the n- nuclear bombs would explode and cause massive um, death around the world. There's that famous uh, line in the Carter-Reagan debate, I'll never forget, where um, President Carter was asked, what's the greatest threat in the world? And he talked about it. He said, well, just the other night, he was asking Amy, his daughter, what her greatest fear is. And she said, nuclear proliferation. It was one of those great lines from a debate nuclear proliferation. There were a lot of people that were really afraid of nuclear proliferation for many years, and and for good reason. It was a great threat. Since 9-11, terror attacks, the threats of massive deaths as a result of terrorism has gotten our attention. And yet nothing has stopped us more in our tracks in my lifetime than a tiny little virus that looks like a soccer ball with a bunch of little things sticking out of it. Because we tend to be so impressed with big things and powerful things, Psalm 30 is a good reminder of us of the power of the tiny. Psalm 30 there, verse 24, talks about the strength of ants and the might of hyraxes. If you don't know what a hyrax is, like I didn't, here's a picture of a hyrax. The wisdom of locusts who can organize even though they don't have a king. And then there's the lizard. Consider the lizard. I think I ought to do a whole series of messages sometimes on just what the Bible has to say about different animals. You know, consider the birds, Jesus said, but consider the power and the clever nature of little lizards. I've read that geckos can curl up on a dime, that there are certain geckos that are so small they can actually curl up on a dime 
to be the size of about half an inch. Verse 28 says, the lizard you may grasp with the hands, yet it, it is in the king's palace. Isn't that a wonderful picture? Can't you imagine the writer of this proverb maybe being in the king's palace one day and watch a little lizard scurry by and he thinks, huh, look at that little guy. How did he get in here? And then he starts to think about all the military garrisons positioned around the palace area, outside and inside the walls. And he imagines if an army tried to storm the walls, they wouldn't be able to get in because we would have a defending army to stop it. Or if lions tried to storm through the city gates, they wouldn't be able to penetrate the, the gates because the soldiers would be able to be there to to, 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 to dis dissuade the powerful lions. But there goes that little lizard who makes his way into the king's bedroom and finds some shade for a rest under the king's roof. Small enough to be held in your hand, and yet it can't be stopped. Who would have predicted two years ago that that tiny little lizard called COVID-19 would sneak under our door and take control of our world as it has? So what do we learn from that little lizard that's made its home in our world in the last year and a half? First of all, COVID has humbled us. How humbling that that little lizard, we haven't been destroyed by nuclear bombs or by terrorist attacks, but this little virus that we can't see has caused businesses to be disrupted and stopped, has caused illnesses and death, has caused political divisions and arguments about to vaccinate or not to vaccinate, to mask or not to mask. It's causing divisions in churches, people quitting churches or, or going to different churches because whatever the church policy on this thing. A year and a half later, and it still has more control over us than we seem to have over it. In a very real way, our reality today it, 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 despite all the progress that we've made in technology, despite all the progress we've made in science, that little microscopic virus puts us closer to the plague of the 16th and 17th century than it does to the flying cars of the Jetsons. COVID ought to humble us. Psalm 103, verse 14 says that God himself knows our form. He is mindful that we are nothing but dust. No matter how far advanced we might get in knowledge or ease or comfort or science, we're still dust. And COVID reminds us, don't get too proud. COVID also reminds us of our mortality, doesn't it? Again, Psalm 78, verse 39, God remembers that we are a wind that passes and does not return. James 4, 14, you don't know what your life will be tomorrow, for you are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. You know, COVID has not changed the statistics on morality, on mortality, or morality, probably. Uh, C.S. Lewis made this point long ago after World War I. He said, you know, mortality rates are, are stubborn things. Every one person who lives dies, and that rate never changes. Life is fragile now. It always has been. It's no more fragile now that COVID is on the increase than it was before COVID was on the increase. We're just more aware of it. We feel more vulnerable to how fragile life is. Every time we go to the grocery store and some guy behind us without a mask coughs in the air, we're reminded that we are uh, living in a world with little lizards called COVID that seem to sneak into our systems and take up residence and threaten even our lives. Speaking of that fragility of life, um, the, the frailty of life, 
reminded of this by what's happening recently right now in Afghanistan. I um, have some missionary friends who have been working in Afghanistan for, uh, I mean, since the early 90s. They have many friends there and, and have developed many friendships over the years. For several weeks, one of my friends was telling me horror stories about things that were happening in Afghanistan in the rural areas long before things were happening in the cities, how the Taliban were coming in and taking daughters and seizing and murdering and raping. But my friend who's a missionary says, but this is normal Christianity. In the United States, we have lived in an abnormal chapter in history when we Christians have been um, largely protected, largely embraced by a, a culture that agrees with us. But most, in most places, in most of history, that's not been the case. And as this chapter quickly comes to a close, it's good for us to be reminded that life has always been fragile. And the answer is not to despair. The answer is to overcome this little threat of, uh, of these viruses, of whether it's death or COVID, uh, terror or COVID, with another little thing called faith. Matthew chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus says, For truly I tell you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will tell this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. I find that verse so encouraging. You know, you, you don't have to have watermelon-sized faith. You don't have to have whale-sized faith. Just, just a little faith placed in the right one is great enough to move mountains. Now, not if the the point here is, if you just have enough faith, you can make something happen by willpower. That's not the point. The, the point is, if God wants to move a mountain, and you have faith that God wants to move that mountain through you, you can ask him, God, move that mountain through me, and he will. Now, the world talks a lot about the power of faith, but so often... Uh, uh, um, it's an empty kind of faith. It's a faith in faith. Well, you just have to have faith. You know, just cheer up. It'll be okay. Faith in faith is, is foolishness. It's empty. Faith in faith is kind of like saying, I'm going to anchor my boat by throwing the anchor in the boat. You anchor the boat by anchoring the boat to something else that is solid and immovable. And our faith is not in ourselves. It's not in the boat that we're in. It's in the rock to which we attach our anchor for the soul. You can't anchor your boat to something that is not secure. That's why Jesus said, the wise are those who build their house on him. But appreciate that, our, again, our faith doesn't have to be huge as long as the object of our faith is strong. It's in the person of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says, Now faith is the certainty of things hoped for, the proof of things not seen. By faith we overcome because we anchor our soul to the promises of God no matter what threatens around us, no matter whether it's a nuclear attack or whether it's a little lizard trying to get into the bedroom. By faith, we know that all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. By faith, we know that God will supply all our needs according to his riches in his glory in Christ Jesus, Philippians 4.19. By faith, we know, as Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Again, Philippians 4.13. By faith, we know that God specializes in turning weakness into strength. One of the bottom lines of Hebrew, that we learn in Hebrews chapter 11. By faith, we know whom we have believed, as Paul says, and we are persuaded that he is able to protect what we have committed to him against the day of, our, of his return.
till he comes. By faith we know 1 John 5, 4, whoever has been born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. But again, if you're discouraged, hey, the faith it doesn't have to be in your goodness. Your faith is not in your ability to have faith. Your faith is not in your strength. Your faith is not certainly in what you can see. Your faith is that Jesus Christ is King. We have a faith that is firmly rooted on the fact that Jesus came from heaven to earth he lived a perfect life, he died on the cross, and he rose from the dead in bodily form. And it's not a faith that's just based on faith, saying, well, I just believe this because I want to believe it. It's a faith. The wonderful thing about the Christian faith is that it is the only faith that is an, hist an historical faith. It is a faith, in other words, the, the, the documents of Christianity challenge you, take us seriously, examine our veracity, Check our history. See if this is true. See if this is verifiable as anything in history can be verified. And then put your faith in what is reasonable, in the one who rose from the dead. How can a little faith that is in you conquer all that is on the outside? The answer is Jesus Christ. Because through Jesus Christ and the cross, our greatest enemy is defeated. Anything that Satan can throw, a, 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 throw against us will fall. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. What lizards are creeping into your palace today? What little lizards do you feel like are threats to you? to your happiness, to your security, to your peace, to your family, to your future, to your plans. Tiny faith in Jesus is greater than all the terrible lizards that Satan can throw your way. Send them away by faith in Christ. Heavenly Father, I thank you that our faith in Jesus is reasonable and victorious. Uh, I'm, I know in my own life, one of the, my greatest needs is for hope when things feel hopeless. I know for everybody that, I'm, that is hearing this, there's, there's some attack. Um, it may be COVID, but there are some other little thing like that that feel so threatening. Lord, I thank you that we can place our feet on the solid ground of Jesus Christ, that he lived and that he lives. And that because he walks with us, we can know strength today. And because he lives with us, we can know that we will live for eternity. Now, help us to be the kind of people who go share that faith with people around us who need hope. We live in a world with people that are so starved for hope, that don't have faith in a rock that is solid. Lord, help us to love other people the way that you love them and to share Jesus boldly, to share your hope boldly in a world where people feel so hopeless. It's through Christ we pray, amen. Thanks for joining us. Hope to see you soon.